past couple of Sundays we have been proceeding with a message in a series but we are not going to that series today in case you're wondering why we did not pass out the little pamphlets to you have you ever been driving down the street and uh, maybe the light was green I used to have a system here in Memphis where especially in the downtown area they could turn the lights red in all directions when there was an emergency vehicle coming through well uh, I've been touching on something for the last few days starting last Sunday and again Tuesday night and uh, the Lord kind of gave me a red light on the series and we just stopped it right where it was because uh, there was an emergency vehicle that he wanted to come through. <laughs> Amen. So, <laughs> so I've been kind of touching upon it, but today I want to really deal with a message that the Lord laid upon my heart. Let's go to the book of St. Mark, the 16th chapter. And I would like to say to those who listen to this uh, broadcast on radio as well as those who view it on television uh, that um, when this telecast shall have closed, I want you to write me. The mailing address uh, is even now on your television screen. That's G.E. Patterson, Post Office Box 1, Memphis, Tennessee, zip 38101. I want to send you a a uh, printed copy of this message, uh, but even more so, I'd like for you to have an audio cassette tape. And uh, if you would send a donation to help keep this ministry on television, then we will be happy to send you uh, the message today. And um, uh, I believe this would be uh, message number 210. I think that's what it is, message number 210. And uh, it is entitled, The Power of Preaching. The Power of Preaching. And uh, in this day and age, you need this message because there are some truths from God's Word that need to once again be rekindled in the hearts of God's people. The book of St. Mark, the 16th chapter, and if you would even read it with me, verse 15 and 16. And these are the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In fact, they are the last words recorded by Mark. Uh, come on and read it with me, verse 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, now before we proceed with the next verse, come on and read this again. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and what? Preach. Wait a minute, wait a minute. And do what? Preach the gospel. Touch somebody and say, Preach the gospel to every creature. Now let's read the next verse. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be damned. That's it. We're going to stop right there. We're talking to you today about the power of preaching. If I knew that this were my last day serving as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and if the Lord told me, to choose whatever sermon you want to leave on record as your last message. I don't believe that there is any other message that I would feel more divinely inspired and under God's command to preach and leave on record as my final testimony other than this message today. The power of preaching. And the message today has a twofold purpose. Now, first of all, I want to challenge every preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ 
Now here at Temple of Deliverance and throughout the Bountiful Blessings Ministry, we have scores of preachers. I don't really know how many. But I'm not only talking to Bountiful Blessings preachers. I'm talking to every truly divinely called, inspired, Holy Ghost anointed minister of God's word. I want to challenge you to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to challenge you even as a general would challenge the soldiers in his army to hold your ground and do what God has commissioned you to do. Preach the gospel to every creature. You don't have to float with the tide. Preachers don't trade your trumpet in on a fiddle. God said cry loud. Spare not. Lift up your voice as a trumpet. And since God gave you a trumpet, don't trade it on a fiddle. The preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only vehicle through which men can be saved. Now listen at the words of the text. And he said, these are the words of Jesus. Now I don't care what anybody said. All scripture, I believe that. All of it is given by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But if you want to minimize or nullify what anybody said, don't attempt to minimize the words of Jesus. And these are the words of Jesus. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth, he that believeth what? The gospel that is preached. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Hmm? But he that believeth not, he that believeth not what? He that believeth not the gospel shall be damned. The preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only vehicle that God has given to mankind through which we can be saved. Now, Apostle Paul foresaw, and you've got to look at this, many of the people who, when we start uh, dispensationalizing the Bible, and when we start categorizing the various characters, there are many who we put in one category, and a careful analysis will show us that they not only fit in that category, they fit in another. David was not only a king, but David was a prophet. Paul was not only an apostle, but Paul was a prophet. And I don't just mean a prophet after the order of foretelling and speaking words of exhortation and comfort, but he was also a prophet as it relates to seeing times to come. And the apostle Paul foresaw the day and time in which we live. And in foreseeing this day and time, his final words of warning to his son Timothy was don't stop preaching. Second Timothy 4 verses 1 through 4, Paul says, I charge thee. Now, he's not just casually saying it, but he is calling Timothy to task. He's laying before him a solemn commandment. He is getting ready to die, and he wants his son in the gospel to have a stern message. He wants to leave it indelibly impressed upon his heart. I charge thee, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. 
Timothy, I'm getting ready to leave you, fella, but there's something I want to leave on record with you. Preach the word. Now, something is going to happen a little later on that's going to stir you up and remind you of my words. Preach the word. Now, listen to the way he says it. Be instant, in season, and out of season. And you can say what you want to, folk. Nowadays, the preaching of the gospel is out of season. <laughs> Did you hear me? Preaching of the gospel is out of season. You know, there was a season when people enjoyed preaching, when they looked forward to preaching. You don't hear what I'm saying. But Paul told Timothy that's going to come a time when they're going to get tired of hearing preachers. But I want you to be instant. I want you to be ready. I want you to be quick. You know how we are. We get ready for breakfast in the morning now. It's not like it was when I was a little boy. And we'd get up in the morning and my dad or my big brother would go out on the yard and kill our, our, our morning breakfast. You know, wring the chicken's neck and, 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 and slide the hen over and get the eggs out from under. You know, it's not like that now. All people do now, they, if they want oatmeal or whatever, they just reach up into the cupboard and, and they pour it in some hot water and, and stir it up, and that's it. Paul said, you better be ready. Don't, don't wait for them to prime you and pump you up. Be instant. Be ready. Be quick. Be prepared. Preach it in season and out of season. Preach it when they want to hear it and preach it when they don't. Now, in the process of preaching, you're going to have to do some reproving. Every once in a while, you're going to have to disapprove of the customs of the people. You're going to have to condemn their habits. Rebuke. You're going to have to sharply criticize what's going on. And then, not only reprove and rebuke, but exhort. In other words, stir them into action. Prod them and make them get up and go. With all long suffering and doctrine. Now, Timothy, why am I telling you to preach the word? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but will after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers. I don't think you heard me. They're going to get tired of preachers proclaiming the gospel and out of a sense of lust worldly pleasure they want to des they desire pleasure they desire the fineries of the world but they don't want to pay the price you don't hear what I'm saying they don't want to suffer they don't want to be thrifty they don't want to be uh, prudent in business they don't want to take the time and have some patience and accumulate substance through the years. They are going to lust after things and they're going to want it right now. So they're going to heap to themselves teachers with itching ears. The people will have itching ears and the teachers will have itching ears. And you live in that day now when they are traveling from seminars to conventions always trying to hear something new. Not concerned about living a dedicated life. Not concerned about waiting for God to bless them in due time. But they're only rattling through the Bible trying to find some blessing that they can confess without taking the time to wait on God. Paul said the teachers are coming. He said, but I want you to hold your ground and preach the word. In that verse 4, Paul said, now what are they going to do? And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fable. You know what fable is? Fable is just another fairy tale. Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman. It's a fable, folk. And believe it or not, people are leaving the truth 
simplify another fictional story. I'm going to say something that's going to shake somebody up now. But folk, it is nothing but a fable to believe that you can have the power and the authority of Christ and never go through the sufferings of Jesus. That's going to need you going through the Bible and finding all of his promises and finding all of the authority that we have through Christ. While you're doing that, check 2 Timothy 2 and 12 where Paul said, if we suffer with him, we'll reign. You can't go through the Bible and pick out all of the glory. You can't pick the roses without getting some of the thorns. Paul said, Timothy, I want you to preach. They're going to scorn you. They're going to ridicule you. They're going to say your day is out, but preach it anyhow. I'm challenging preachers now. The modern day teachers are tempting to develop the scholarly church. You see, the devil does not necessarily change. He just kind of glamorizes his product. But when he presents it, he presents the same old thing. When I was a little boy growing up in the church, there always uh, was this uh, movement toward uh, and, and don't get me wrong, education is fine. But there have always been those persons that because they thought they knew a little something, they didn't want to follow the preacher because their education exceeded his. Hello, somebody. Now the devil has brought that thing back another way. Now they saw they could not from the inside of the church overturn it with their knowledge. So consequently now you don't have to be a preacher. All you got to do is be able to have some kind of wisdom and explain the scripture and you can open you up a word center and you can teach. Hello somebody. And the teachers are condemning preaching. The teachers are saying that nothing has been done all these years. That the preachers are getting up hooping and hollering and the folk are not learning anything. But here's what you've got to look at. Preaching is the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Teaching is more of an explanation. There are some things that God has given that can be explained. But don't forget God is the ultimate mystery. Can thou by searching understand him? There are things about God you cannot explain. And God said, don't waste your time always trying to explain every line. But just proclaim my word. People have got to know that if God says it's black, it's black. If God says it's white, it's white. And that's not to be explained, it's to be believed and obeyed. Sit down, y'all. teachers are trying to develop the scholarly church. They deal in etymology. Etymology is taking a word and tracing its history and its origin. But while they are trying to deal in etymology, they are coming into conflict with the last chapter of God's word. In the last chapter of the book of the Revelation, 
The Lord said, don't add. Because if you add to this, I'm going to add the plagues written therein. Don't you take away, because if you do, I'm going to take your part out of the book of life. And when the modern day teachers run up to something that King James Version doesn't agree with, they put it on the side and they get that other Bible that said what they wanted to say. And they tell you the Bible that the preacher preached from when you were saved didn't translate the word right. But Jesus lets you know don't mess with it. For every jot and every tittle of it, the jot and the tittle is the dotting of the I and the crossing of the T. Not only does he not want you to mess with changing the commas and changing the words, don't even mess with the dotting of the I and the crossing of the T. And then if we all had to be etymologists to be saved, Isaiah would be wrong. Isaiah said in Isaiah 35 and 8 that a highway should be that and a way and it shall be called the way of holiness. It will be for those the wayfaring men, though fools, though the illiterate, though the uneducated shall not err or make a mistake therein. And God designed this holy way to be so plain that if you never had a college degree, if you never heard the word etymology, you could still be saved by the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then I'm afraid that many of them have gotten so deep into trying to prove what a mystery they are. You know, when you become the mystery and you can explain everything, you don't need Jesus. You don't need the Holy Ghost. I like what Paul told the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 2, beginning with verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything. Fellas around here talking about they know Greek and don't know English. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. So why did I do it that way? The next verse said that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. Woo-wee! Some of these folk, their faith is wrapped up in that great teacher. But God, through Paul, the man who could speak seven languages, God, through Paul, the man who was really eloquent, he said, I didn't want you to get bogged down in my wisdom, but I want your faith to stand in the power of God. And while many of you are trusting in what you call the new latter-day revelation, I want you to know that latter-day revelation is about to mess you up. You better put your faith in God and in the power of the Holy Ghost. For there are some things I don't care how much you confess it. I don't care how much you stand on it. Jesus is Lord. And there is a place that Jesus has that you will never have. And anybody that tell you that as the body of Christ, everything is under you, they are telling you a lie. It's true that he said you've got power to tread on serpents and on scorpions, but there is more in this universe than serpents and scorpions. Hello, somebody. Your husband that whip you twice a week, he ain't under your feet. 
that bill collector that's hounding you, he's not under your feet. There are a whole lot of situations and circumstances that are under the feet of Jesus that's not under your feet. Thank you, Lord. I want to again remind you, preachers, that the Lord wants you to stand in the place where he's appointed you and preach the word. Hallelujah. I just want to leave this other verse with you from 1 Corinthians 1, beginning with verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Now anytime somebody condemn preaching, you know they perishing. But unto us, which are saved. Hmm? It is. What is? The preaching of the cross. It is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. You're not going to give the world a knowledge of Christ by your wisdom. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And when you get through arguing your case, woo, call me whatever you want to, but I'll stand as a foolish preacher. <laughs> Sit down. Hallelujah. Preachers, I challenge you. To preach the gospel because you are the world's only hope. Hello? I challenge it. Preachers in this building and preachers watching me on television and listening by radio and cassette tape. Don't trade in your trumpet for a fiddle. Preach the word. Glory be unto God. The world as we know it is headed for certain destruction. I was looking the other day at the news and some space vessel that the United States has sent out in the interplanetary space. They said that it would survive longer than the Earth itself, believing that after it has passed beyond our solar system, that somewhere in the billions of years to come, if there is life on any other planet, they are hoping that somebody will discover what we were about. Even science recognizes that our world can no longer survive as it is constituted. Well, they're not disagreeing with the Bible. For the Lord let us know that one of these days that the elements are going to catch on fire. And even the heavens will roll up like a scroll. And Jesus told his disciples that you're trying to show me the beautiful building of the temple. But that's coming a day when there will not be one stone left on another that shall not be torn down. Well, his disciples said, Lord, if all of this is going to happen, it must be a signal of your return and of the end of the world. So what we want to know is what will be a signal of that end. Jesus told them there in the 24th chapter of St. Matthew that take heed 
that no man deceive you. Many are going to come in my name saying that I am Christ. Now you got to understand that statement. They're not coming and saying that come and worship me, I am Jesus. But they are saying that we are the body. And that is one of the names of the church, sure, we are the body. But that emphasis is not on discipleship, but on the fact that we are the body. And when they get through explaining the body, it simply means that everything that Jesus is, we are. And consequently, they become little Jesuses. And anybody who don't go along with that teaching, they are quick to condemn them. You don't hear what I'm saying. And many of them have been made to blaspheme because people that used to be saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues, they are now saying that they didn't have nothing and we don't have nothing. And when you come to that point, you have blasphemed the Holy Ghost. If you don't believe it, read St. Mark chapter 3, verse 28 and 29. There were those that told Jesus that you are casting out devils by the power of Beelzebub. And Jesus let them know that if you blaspheme the name of the Son of God, you can have forgiveness. But if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, there will be no forgiveness, not in this world, nor in the world to come. And if you want to check it, Father, look at St. Matthew, the 12th chapter, and in verse 24, and you will find that they were condemning Jesus, talking about the Spirit operating in him. And when he condemned them for blaspheming the Holy Ghost, he was making a direct reference to them calling what he was moving in something false and phony. And Jesus said, when you condemn the spirit of the Holy Ghost, you are blaspheming. And when you who have been in holiness, when you who have been sanctified, speaking in another tongue, and said it was the Holy Ghost. And that same thing stopped you from smoking, stopped you from drinking, stopped you from committing adultery. And now you crossed over into what you call a word ministry. And you're looking back at this and saying that it's not real. Honey, you're not condemning Gilbert Patterson. You're not condemning bountiful blessings. You're not condemning full gospel ministries, but you are talking against the Holy Ghost because it doesn't matter what you said. I know that couldn't nothing but a real God pull my feet out of the miry clay. Couldn't nothing but a real God baptize me with his presence. And when I open my mouth to speak in tongues, it's not Gilbert speaking, but I'm speaking as the Holy Ghost give utterance. And you better be careful about how you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Yeah. I'm gonna have to quit. Glory to Jesus. Glory. Preachers. Woo. Don't stop preaching. Don't let nobody shame you out of preaching. Sit down, y'all. In my conclusion, hey, Lord, I want to tell the church, mm, glory. Woo. I'm trying to quit, but my help is here. Yeah, yeah. I know they say, you know, all that moaning and groaning ain't about nothing. Well, they must didn't read Joel 1 and 13. Because I heard him say, how, ye ministers of the altar. And sometimes you got to say it, and you got to howl a little bit with it. Ah! Thank you, Lord. 
thank the Lord. Thank you. Somebody in here know what I'm talking about. You had a bad case of the can't help it. Gambling and couldn't help it. Drinking and couldn't help it. Shacking and couldn't help it. Getting drunk and couldn't help it. Stealing and couldn't help it. And you went to the meeting one night. You didn't intend for nothing to happen. But when the preacher got up, looked like he'd been where you'd been. He told you from the word of God that the wages of sin is death. And all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost fell on him. And you don't even know how you got to the altar. But every since that day, you had a new way of walking. You had a new way of talking. Ah, glory to God. Hey. Glory. Glory. Ah. Hey, Lord. Sit down. In my conclusion, I've been talking to preachers, but let me talk to you lay people for a few minutes. Oh, Lord. Mm. I'm talking about you who receive the preached word of God. You got to realize that religion nowadays has become competitive. And most folk don't even think about the souls they are misleading. All that they're trying to find is a way to knock the person who's doing what they want to do. Now the reason a whole lot of them are fighting preachers is because they themselves, as I told you, they are in that group that want to run the church. Hello, folk. But they couldn't get around the preacher. So they had to set them up a center. Mm, Lord. Where preaching is defamed. But I hear Paul in Romans 10. Yay. And I don't care how many of you folk talking about you are saved. You can't be saved without coming by the preacher. I hear Paul in Romans 10 and 13. Say, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now you might have become emotionally overcome and stretched out like a board while that quartet singer was standing there slapping his hips. But I want you to know that didn't save you. Woo! You might have become emotionally overcharged when somebody gave a good testimony. But I want to tell you that testimony didn't save you. It might have been a mind-boggling experience when you went to hear some shrewd teacher take the Bible and misinterpret it and wrongly divide it and make you a candidate for their occult. But the only way you can get saved, you got to hear the preacher. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? He said, and how shall they preach except they be sent? And the reason a lot of them are condemning preachers, God didn't send them. They're talking about bringing the Lord back. But as I mentioned earlier in the 24th chapter of St. Matthew, Jesus said, don't be deceived. Many shall arise and say that I am Christ. Woo! There are going to be wars and rumors of wars. Earthquakes in divers places. Famines and pestilences. But all of these are the beginning of sorrow. But if you want to know when I'm coming back, and this gospel 
of the kingdom it must be preached I did say preached in all the world as a testimony unto me then shall the end come preachers if you stop preaching Jesus can't come back preachers don't let nobody shame you out of it whether men want to hear it or not preach it glory to God Let me close. Whoa, sit down. Layman, I'm trying to get to you. Something you better remember. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you which also ye have received and wherein ye stand by which also ye are saved now listen to that paul said i preached it to you and what i preached to you is what you received and what you received is what you're standing in and what you're standing in is a thing by which you're saved but the only way all of this is true if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you. If you forget it, farewell. If you reject it, too bad. Glory to God. He said, I just want you to stand in it. I want you to keep it in your memory. If it was good enough to save you, it's good enough to keep you glory if it was good enough to lift you it's good enough to uphold you yeah and I hear him say I didn't come to you with a new revelation but I preached you the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ verse 3 I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Yeah, maybe it doesn't make sense, but that's what it takes to save you. The simplicity of the gospel. When you were lost in your sin, on your way to hell, without a God on your side, I told you that Jesus was hung up for your hang-ups I told you that they nailed him to the cross I told you that they buried him in Joseph's new tomb I told you that for three days and night he was in the heart of the earth but early can I hear somebody say early 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 morning got up out of the grave stood with one foot resting in time and another in eternity and said all power all power in heaven and in earth is in my hand you got some of it but you don't have it all I got the key of death and hell if death give you trouble tell me about it if hell turns against you tell me about it i got the key oh Glory of God, it is the 
word of God. Bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah.